All right, people may still be trickling in, but we have a lot to cover today, so I will kick it off. Thank you all so much for joining us today for this webinar, Gearing Up for 2030, Building the Offshore Wind Supply Chain and Workforce Needed to Deploy 30 Gigawatts and Beyond. We are really excited to dive into these topics and share some of the recent research that we've published in this area. My name is Matilda Kreider. I am a research in the, researcher in the Wind Stakeholder Engagement and Outreach Group at the National Renewable Energy Lab. I'll be starting off the webinar today before passing it off to our great speakers. Next slide. Thanks, Derek. Um, I, I will first start with some quick webinar logistics. This webinar is being recorded and the recording and webinar slides will be sent out to all registrants via email, as well as published to the NREL YouTube channel and the Department of Energy's Wind Exchange website. As always, we would like to thank the Department of Energy for their support of this webinar series. After the presentations, there will be an opportunity to pose questions to our speakers. So we encourage you to add your questions throughout the webinar or during the Q&A portion using the Zoom Q&A function. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers, Dr. Matthew Shields and Jeremy Stefik. Matt Shields joined NREL in 2018 and leads the lab's work on offshore wind techno-economic analysis, which involves developing cost models, analyzing market and technology trends, and projecting the future cost of offshore wind. He has conducted, conducted analysis on the cost impacts of turbine and plant upsizing, supply chain opportunities for the domestic offshore wind industry, floating wind marine logistics, and feasibility assessments for novel technological solutions. He is the lead author of NREL's recent offshore wind supply chain roadmap reports. Matt's presentation will be followed by Jeremy Stefik, who is a member of the Technology, Engineering, and Deployment Group at the National Wind Technology Center at NREL. His research areas include workforce, economic, and community development for land-based wind, offshore wind, and water power technologies. Jeremy leads the wind workforce analysis efforts, which seek to understand the needs of industry, educational institutions, and students. He manages the Jobs and Economic Development Impact, or JEDI models, and conducts economic impacts analysis. Jeremy also supports stakeholder engagement activities, providing community resources related to economic development from wind energy, and he is the lead author of NREL's recent Offshore Wind Workforce Report. So in today's webinar, we will begin with a brief introduction to offshore wind energy in the United States, and then we will dive into the basics of the offshore wind supply chain and workforce. Finally, we will introduce two recent reports that NREL has published on these topics in case you find that you want to know more after this webinar. So the reason that we're looking to 2030 as a benchmark is that two years ago, the Biden administration set a target of installing 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. To reach this target, the administration made commitments to supporting the deployment of offshore wind projects that will create well-paying unionized jobs, providing investments into infrastructure like ports, vessels, and manufacturing facilities, all of which are critical components of a domestic supply chain, and supporting critical research and development and data sharing. Today, uh, clearly today's webinars topics fit right into these Biden administration priorities for steps to reach 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. So right now in the United States, uh, there are research and development projects underway to begin deploying offshore wind in all four major bodies of water, the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Great Lakes. We only have 42 megawatts of operating offshore wind across two projects off the coast of Rhode Island and Virginia right now. But as you can see in the graphic to the right, there are planned projects in the pipeline that are capable of meeting the 30 gigawatt goal. And this includes 19 projects expected to be constructed off the Atlantic coast in the next five years. Uh, two of those projects are currently under construction and are expected to be completed later, later this year. And those are Vineyard Wind 1 and South Fork Wind. So now that we have this foundational understanding of where we are hoping to go with offshore wind, I'm going to pa pass the baton to Matt Shields for an introduction to the offshore wind supply chain. Thanks very much for the introduction, uh, Matilda, and, and glad to be here as part of this webinar. Um, again, my name is Matt Shields, and I've been uh, doing a lot of work looking at the offshore wind supply chain in, in the last couple of years. Um, one of the really key takeaways that, that we've learned and, and heard from uh, folks throughout the offshore wind sector and, and from our own sort of analysis work is that um, developing a, a domestic supply chain um, is really important for, for, for um, putting forth a sustainable and equitable offshore wind industry in the U.S. Um, there are a lot of um, challenges that the, the deployment targets that um, face in order to meet some of the uh, or to install the projects that Matilda listed on the previous slide. Um, some of the challenges are just that um, there's a 
there's a huge demand for offshore wind components worldwide, um, as well as sort of the port and vessel and workforce resources needed to build them. Uh, it's likely not realistic to assume that we can import everything that we need from Europe. And of course, if we do so, uh, we're missing on the opportunity to develop jobs and economic benefits within the U.S. as well. So there is a, there's a there's a good value proposition for de developing this domestic supply chain um, so that we can uh, actually meet our deployment targets and create more benefits locally while we do it. But developing the supply chain is challenging. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the scope of the supply chain is, basically how big it would need to be and, and what sort of resources we would need in order to meet our targets. Um, how long it would take to build and permit and, and, and uh, plan out the critical resources we need. Uh, how the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and other incentive policies impact the um, sort of value proposition of moving uh, offshore wind manufacturing to the U.S., um, how much investment is required, what the type of benefits that could be available to local communities and workers are, and um, how significant the gaps are in what we currently have and what we actually need. Uh, next slide, thanks. Perfect. Um, so, we, we've looked at in some recent studies, what would we actually need for an offshore supply chain? What, is, what do we mean when we talk about a supply chain that can meet um, the deployment targets that we would need around 2030 or the sort of the average deployment around 2030? Um, well, this graphic on the right shows how uh, we investing over time in vessels, ports, manufacturing facilities, uh, steel plate manufacturing, thing, things of that nature. Um, would require over $22 billion um, to, to build up those capabilities that we need um, with, you know, one area that we would highlight is the level of investment you would need in, in ports and the large installation vessels. So it's not just the manufacturing facilities, it's also the infrastructure you need to actually transport and install projects. Um, the There would be about 2,100 turbines you need to install in U.S. waters to reach 30 gigawatts by 2030. And these investment levels that we're talking about correspond to the um, sort of the manufacturing capabilities that we would need to develop over time to, um, to, to build some of those next generation turbines and then the supporting um, sort of infrastructure and, and balance of system components that you need to, um, to, to install projects. Um, we estimate that this is uh, this probably needs at least 34 major manufacturing facilities, and there may even be more than that if we start to talk about uh, sort of regional supply chains or, or developing resources within particular regions that have uh, that that meet the specific um, goals of those regions, uh, as well as any potential uh, sort of additional competition that may be introduced into the market with with different manufacturers of different products. Um, but we can see that there is a pretty significant uh, investment that would be required over the next seven or eight years in order to get to what we would consider to be a, a fairly robust and sustainable supply chain uh, by 2030. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in addition to these sort of big manufacturing facilities and the big ports and the big vessels, there's there's a lot of other support work uh, that, that needs to be done to make a, this, this supply chain really resilient and sustainable. Um, so one of which would be, you know, we view that there are uh, there's a big role for existing U.S. businesses to play in the supply chain. Um, there's a there are a lot of industries with existing manufacturing capabilities in the U.S. Whether it's for land-based wind, for oil and gas, for aerospace, for shipbuilding, what you know, whatever it is, I think that there's a lot of companies that that have skill sets that are uh, applicable to the offshore and manufacturing that we need. Um, and so there would have to there's an opportunity to kind of stand up those supporting suppliers um, and, and help them to sort of retrain and recertify and re-equip so that they can produce the, the supporting components that feed into these major components like towers and blades and nacelles uh, that, that you can see in, in big offshore wind projects. This would also require um, recruiting and training a specialized workforce, uh, which Jeremy will talk a little bit about um, when uh, after I uh, finish up here. Um, and What's, I think what's really important to flag here is that the the it's just the breadth and of this supply chain would will require significant coordination between a lot of different stakeholders, um, where there's a, there's a need to um, to to help each other kind of strategically plan out what what each group can do to develop a supply chain, and um, what the what the, the the pathways are and sort of investment requirements and the training requirements and the, the the certainty of when those components are going to be needed online. Um, so I think that there's quite a bit of uh, communication that can help to de-risk the development of, of the supply chain kind of throughout out all 
sort of sizes of components. Um, and then finally, we view this as a, as a real opportunity to develop this new industry in the US from an equitable perspective, where instead of sort of imposing um, manufacturing or port facilities on, uh, on, on, uh, on existing communities, there's, a, uh, there's an upfront and ongoing engagement process between communities um, and project developers and manufacturers to, uh, to try to provide benefits and mitigate ne negative impacts on these communities. Next slide, please. So uh, just to highlight a point from the pre previous slide, there is just a, a huge spectrum of the stakeholders that we would consider to be relevant for, uh, for supply chain development. And I actually wouldn't even say this is an exhaustive list, but, but at a high level, you're looking at um, you know, the sort of the offshore wind developers who are the ultimate customers of, of, of the supply chain components that you're building, um, the businesses that are that are building those components and then the supporting components, the businesses that are transporting them, the ports at which you're staging and, and transporting these massive components, the state governments, which are helping to, to coordinate the work, um, who are helping to, to bring the manufacturing companies to, to the U.S. and coordinate with the, the existing businesses and, and resources within their state. Uh, the communities themselves, which is where many of these, these manufacturing facilities will be located. Um, and then the, the workforce piece. So this uh, labor uh, labor unions are, are a big piece of this and will be a big piece of the manufacturing and, and project installation work. Um, and, and the training institutions, whether they're existing sort of pre-apprenticeship programs or, or new community college or, or new training programs that are being developed and need to still be developed in order to get our manufacturing workforce to the place it needs to be. Uh, next slide, thanks. So this is a um, this is a graphic that we include in some of our reports um, to uh, to show where the manufacturing facilities have been announced or planned in the U.S. Um, so this is as of uh, early this year, January 2023, um, and what that means is that it's kind of already out of date. Um, you know, anytime we put a timestamp on some of these figures, there it seems like there's a new announcement that comes out a couple of weeks later. Um, so the so there have been further announcements since we've uh, since since this map has has been updated most recently. Um, but what we can see is that there's there's sort of a significant concentration of these major manufacturing facilities uh, in the, the North Atlantic uh, in relatively close proximity to the, the offshore wind lease areas. But we're starting to see more and more um, expansion into non-coastal states and, and regions other than the, the North Atlantic. Um, and so the case in point is that in 2021, we saw some announcements for um, for manufacturing taking place in Texas, uh, one of which is uh, so uh, an offshore substation being used for the South Fork wind farm. And then uh, I guess this is actually before 2021, the announcement of the of a wind turbine installation being built in Texas as well. Um, and we're starting to see more expansion of um, uh, the, sort of the supporting supply chain and the engagement with, with existing businesses going beyond these coastal states as well. Um, ultimately, the major components have to be manufactured on a waterway because they're just too big to transport uh, via road or rail. Um, so I think that there's that's why we see part of this concentration of uh, of these big facilities kind of in, in the North Atlantic region. But um, the, the, the point to note here is that um, we are seeing a fairly significant uh, level of, of planned investment and, and in some cases ongoing investment uh, in these facilities, both ports uh, and manufacturing. Uh, and we expect to see that grow over um, uh, over the next few years. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I mentioned this on the previous slide, um, but I think something that's important to understand when we're talking about the port facilities where uh, where these these components are being built is that the there's just a, a the the size of offshore wind components is just so massive that this requires a lot of waterfront infrastructure for both the fabrication of the major components as well as then the uh, the, the marshalling by which we would mean the a, a port where you store components until they're ready to be loaded onto a vessel and transported out to the project site. Um, so there's there's a demand for dozens of these port facilities uh, in the US. Um, again, it, I mentioned before that we need upwards of 30 manufacturing facilities if we're going to have a domestic supply chain. Um, each one of those components or facilities would, would need their own fabrication port or at least space at a marshalling port. Uh, to to do that manufacturing work, um, so this is a this is a big demand for for space and resources, 
Um, there is a little, a little bit of a difficulty in finding available space along the East Coast uh, for new development. So we're mostly looking at um, at, at building these on uh, or, or expanding out existing ports uh, in order to, to accommodate this work. Next slide, please. So um, developing a port facility, again, you, you, we can modify an existing port or construct a new port. Um, one of the examples of building a new port is the, the New Jersey wind port. You see a rendering of it here on the left. Uh, this is on the Delaware River in New Jersey, and they're, they're developing this from a greenfield site location. Uh, there's been a significant investment from the state of New Jersey um, in order to, to, um, to basically develop this world-class uh, offshore wind port facility. Uh, and the, the, the plan here is that this will um, be a pretty expansive facility that then uh, encompasses, at the end of the day, both the marshalling and manufacturing activities. Um, a lot of the manufacturing announcements we've seen to date have been at existing ports where there, um, there there's uh, the existing waterfront resources, but in almost every case we're seeing uh, the need for significant upgrades at these ports in the order of several hundred million dollars where you're strengthening the bearing capacity at these ports or you're clearing land for make sure there's sufficient um sufficient area for, for the manufacturing resources you need or or possibly doing some, some dredging or uh, work on the navigation channels to make sure that you can get the components out to um, out through the waterways. So uh, ultimately, this means that, that, that all of these ports require a pretty significant permitting and construction process, uh, sometimes in the order of, of up to five years in order to um, to go through all the stakeholder outreach and permitting process and, uh, of course, the financing and construction piece as well. So I think it's important to recognize that, that developing these ports is, is not a quick solution. It's something which re requires quite a bit of strategy, uh, investment, and, and planning to, to do it appropriately. Uh, next slide, please. So closely related to the, the ports or the vessels that we would need to, to use for offshore wind project installation, uh, I think three of the ones that we focused heavily on in some of our work have been the wind turbine installation vessel, the heavy lift vessels, and, and the feeder barges. Um, the WTIVs or, or wind turbine installation vessels are, are really unique vessels um, which are exclusively designed for the offshore wind market. You can see a photo of one here on the left, uh, so a, a slightly old model actually. Um, the, these vessels typically uh, have these jack up legs you can see that can raise the, the vessel off of the water um, to provide a stable platform to install the towers and nacelle and blades at the project site. Um, so, so those high lift cranes uh, make this a, a very specialized vessel doing very delicate work with, with again, extremely massive components uh, at, at the project site. Um, there is a, a real shortage of WTIVs um, globally. And this means that um, there's going there's a little bit of a bottleneck of how many of these vessels are available to install offshore wind projects um, in, for, in the U.S. Or, or really anywhere throughout the globe. Um, so this is this is a risk that's been identified for for deployment targets and and needs some uh, investment in planning to develop the, the sort of a, a sufficient fleet to um, to do the installation work. Um, heavy lift vessels, um, traditionally used in oil and gas, um, typically will be used for offshore wind foundations. Um, these are massive structures, but don't quite require that that uh, the height of the crane that you see on the wind turbine installation vessel. So these vessels can be either repurposed from the oil and gas industry or what we're seeing uh, the, the potential for as well as some new vessels being developed uh, for oil or for, for offshore wind. Um, and then finally, we're seeing uh, feeder barges being developed in the U.S., which would transport components from, um, from a marshalling site to the project site. Um, there's a regulation known as the Jones Act, which means that a, a vessel transporting goods between ports in the U.S. has to be U.S. flagged. Um, and an offshore wind turbine counts as a port. So what that means is that these installation vessels, like a WTIV or a heavy lift vessel, um, if they are foreign flagged, then they need to be fed by by a barge or a system which which transfers the components out from the the port to the project site. Um, so, uh, given the shortage of vessels like WTIVs and, and heavy lift vessels globally, um, there's likely to be some reliance on these these foreign flagged vessels, meaning that we have a need for some of these specialized feeder barges that can that can transport the components out um, to to a, a non-US flagged vessel. 
That being said, we're also building US flag WTIVs. There's one, as I mentioned, under construction in Texas, and, and there's a plan that these could be a big part of the installation uh, strategies moving forward. Um, finally, it's just worth mentioning that, the, that although we've kind of highlighted three vessels here, there's a significant demand for other types of installation vessels, survey, survey vessels, cable lay vessels, um, geotech vessels, uh, crew transfer vessels, service and operation vessels. I mean, there, there are going to be hundreds and hundreds of vessels which will be active in, in the U.S. fleet. Um, so the, I think that there's a there's a significant number of vessels that need to be developed um, and, and uh, understand their role in, in some of these, pro these uh, projects in the U.S. Uh, next slide, thanks. So uh, as I mentioned, the Jones Act requires these, uh, these um, either a U.S. vessel or a, a sort of hybrid solution with a foreign flagged installation vessel and a U.S. flagged feeder barge. Um, the, uh, the, the existing number of, of ports and vessels in the U.S. poses a, a, a real bottleneck for the, for the installation targets that we're aiming for. Uh, this graphic on the right shows that uh, a baseline scenario, which is where you basically don't invest in any more ports and vessels than we've already uh, than we've already got, caps our installation at, at maybe 15 gigawatts or less by 2030. So that's that's about half of the the Biden administration's target. Um, but by investing in these ports or vessels, um, either U.S. flagged or foreign flagged, depending on the strategy that you use. We, we can meet those deployment targets, um, although with a with a fairly significant investment of, of a, around six billion dollars. Um, the the building these vessels um, is is not just an investment challenge. Um, the there are limited shipyards with the capability and, and capacity to do this. Uh, shipyards have existing order books and they need to um, they need to see a clear business model in order to to invest in, in in their time in building one of these offshore wind vessels. So it may take three or four years to build a new WTIV. Um, but again, with this the, this global shortage of WTIVs, this sort of investment is a really important way to de-risk our uh, our deployment targets in the U.S. Uh, next slide, thanks. I've mentioned a bit about the supporting supply chain. Um, and, and one of the areas that, that we found and that, that Jeremy will talk about shortly here is that although there's a significant opportunity for jobs in the major manufacturing facilities that we see, um, there could be as many as five times as many jobs available in the, the supporting supply chain. So these are the, the existing businesses that, that could be making um, the, the parts and subassemblies that, that feed into the, the major offshore wind components. Um, and this is an again an opportunity to, for existing businesses to pivot from from their own industries into offshore wind, but it would require a significant level of investment and coordination and outreach to to make people aware of this opportunity and make it clear what the pathways are for getting involved in in offshore wind. Uh, next slide, please. So to to start to wrap things up here, I think that some of the benefits of of creating a domestic offshore wind supply chain. I think to me um, is that the one of the most important things to note is that it's not realistic to rely on global supply chains to, to meet our deployment targets. Certainly there'll be a big part of what we're doing as, as our own manufacturing and supply chain ramps up, um, but relying on them long-term is challenging because other countries and other regions are, have the same types of ambitious offshore wind targets that we have. Um, so when manufacturing facilities in Europe um, are pretty committed to, to the offshore wind projects, which are also located in Europe. So if we really want to meet these offshore wind targets that we're setting for ourselves, we need the ability to, to manufacture a, a, a sort of a significant portion of our own, um, of our own components. Um, not, not only is the sort of global bottleneck an issue, but I think we've seen in recent years um, disruptions to global supply chains from from COVID and from the Russia Ukraine war and things of this nature, and uh, I think that's that's um, highlighted some of the geopolitical risks and and other sort of supply chain risks that can really adversely impact clean energy deployment. Um, and so, being able to control more more of that locally gives us a better chance of of and a, a, a less risky chance of of meeting our own deployment targets. But if we and if we do this. Uh, create this domestic supply chain, it's not just 
um, sort of a, a risk framework, but the uh, the level of benefits that we can create create within the country are are really significant. Tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs, uh, billions of dollars of added uh, added value to the GDP, and creating these benefits both in coastal states and non coastal states. Um, and and what we can do as we develop these um, these jobs and these manufacturing resources is to sort of customize the supply chain for the U.S. market. The, the U.S. offshore wind industry is not a carbon copy of what's happening in Europe. The conditions are different here. The ports are different. The wind, the seafloor conditions, the regulatory environment, things are different here. So we, we will need our own supply chain, which is tuned for, for the, the unique conditions that we have here. Um, and this is something that we can do over the 2020s as we, in the short term, work with overseas suppliers to start building projects as we can, but evolve to the point that we have a, um, a, a sort of a local and robust and reliable um, uh, supply chain in the U.S. Uh, next slide, thanks. So um, this is just a slight expansion on those uh, the, the economic impacts I had mentioned here, and, and I won't go into this in, in too much detail, but the, the point of the figure on the right is that when we look at these major manufacturing facilities uh, and the associated jobs, they're pretty concentrated along the coastal states. But when we look at where the manufacturing and supplier jobs, the, the supporting supply chain could exist, you can see there's a potential or an opportunity space in states all throughout the country to provide some supporting components and, and, and uh, contribution to the offshore wind workforce. So um, this is definitely a challenge in terms of standing up the, the workforce and the capabilities in these, in these states to serve the industry, but it is really an, an opportunity to um, sort of mobilize beyond just the states that have offshore wind procurement targets and to engage sort of a, a broader industry and, and again to create this more reliable and, and robust supply chain. Uh, next slide, please. So the majority of, of what we've been talking about today is um, covered in a, in a recent publication from, from NREL, along with some of our partners at the Business Network for Offshore Wind, uh, Tufts University, um, DNV, as well. Uh, and this, this project was funded by the National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium, uh, the Department of Energy, uh, the state of Maryland, the state of New York, uh, had, a, had a lot of support from, from various different state governments. Um, and in this report, we look at a roadmap for develop, developing the supply chain by 2030, uh, talking about barriers, solutions, some of the major factors like manufacturing facilities, ports, vessels, workforce, and equity that you need to consider, um, and, and then present some scenarios about what are the potential benefits if we develop this supply chain and some of the consequences if we don't. Uh, so we this is sort of a discussion of next steps for the industry of, of what we can do in the short term to get the this supply chain off the ground and then how we can expand it beyond 2030. So what happens when floating wind becomes a bigger part of the supply chain, for example. Um, and the, these are some of the considerations which will be important for us to help sort of strategically plan out this, this development uh, and, and really create the, the benefits both to the offshore wind industry as well as to the, the, the workers and the economy within the U.S. So with that being said, I will um, hand the, the microphone off to my colleague, Jeremy Stefik, who will talk a bit more about the offshore wind energy workforce. Thanks, Matt. Um, it really was a pleasure to work with you and the team on the, the supply chain roadmap. Um, it's really a great opportunity to build upon the existing manufacturing capacity in the United States. And I'm really excited to see how it develops in the next few years, and especially the supply chain impacts to the US workforce. Um, so speaking of workforce, uh, next up, we're sharing some key insights from the recently published U.S. Offshore Wind Workforce Assessment, uh, which was funded uh, by the Department of Energy Wind Energy Technologies Office. Um, so the offshore wind industry represents an opportunity to support a new emerging industry. Um, it's not often that you get the chance to build up a new workforce so quickly. Um, so as a group here today, I would really empower us all to think about how we can create awareness and ensure people and communities know about these job opportunities that they're coming and uh, get them excited to participate um, in the offshore wind workforce. Um, so kind of kicking us off here with the introduction to the offshore wind workforce. Um, so offshore wind energy projects are complex and they require an extensive, varied, diverse, and a well-trained workforce. 
In the assessment, we took the approach of grouping the offshore wind workforce into these five key industry segments, including development, manufacturing and supply chain, which Matt just touched on, um, and then the installation activities using ports, and then also maritime construction using vessels, and then finally operations and maintenance. The offshore wind workforce assessment does cover all these different industry segments more in depth. It discusses the number of jobs, the different roles within each of these segments, and kind of some of the uh, training opportunities and gaps that we identified. Um, each segment does support a different part of the offshore wind project, and all these different uh, segments have unique skills, training needs, and credentials. So through this assessment, um, we determined that the average annual employment level will be between, will be between 15,000 and 58,000 full-time equivalent workers each year to meet these 2030 targets. So this 15 to 58,000 is a range. It includes both direct and indirect jobs. So those building the project, but also support, supporting the supply chain. Uh, but it does not include those additional jobs and communities supported by offshore wind activity. Those are known as induced impact jobs. So those in restaurants, uh, retailers, hotels, kind of those extra benefits to communities uh, that is not included in this estimate. Um, we expect that the total workforce need is expected to start towards the bottom of this range and grow over time as the offshore wind industry develops. Uh, the more domestic content that develops, so the more manufacturers and more suppliers that are involved in offshore wind, the higher the, the U.S. employment for offshore wind energy will be. Next slide, please. So knowing the number of jobs is only half the equation. Uh, knowing the timing of when we need to train and hire the workforce to effectively meet this demand is also extremely important. Um, here I've provided just two examples to highlight the relationship between the sizing and the timing of the job need. Um, so manufacturing ports vessels um, will all require basic and skilled trades. Uh, across all of these segments, this, these skilled trades are really the largest contributor of jobs in the U.S. offshore wind energy industry. Um, which is a great opportunity for labor unions, vocational schools, and community colleges to supply the industry. Um, however, there are peaks and troughs when these workers are needed. So we need to consider how we can most efficiently train and hire a workforce uh, to, to lessen that uncertainty around hiring and layoffs over time, and therefore enabling work certainty for workers and companies. Um, on the supply side, on the bottom of the slide, the timing of training needs is also an important consideration. So some jobs roles require an advanced degree, such as an engineer, while others need more specialized training plus experience. Um, it can take several years to, uh, to train and provide workers experience, um, especially with some of these multi-year apprenticeship programs. Um, so the key question is really, how do we align these training programs and hiring to meet this magnitude of demand, uh, especially as the workforce is expected to ramp over time between now and 2030? Next slide, please. So the chart here on the left is showing the size of the contribution of each of the industry segments. This does assume that all labor components and suppliers are sourced from the United States. Uh, do want to put a bit a big asterisk here is that this is extremely important to acknowledge that this is an unlikely scenario given current market labor costs and supply chain trends. But what we wanted to do in analysis was to show the potential opportunity spaces for the industry. So the data is indicating that the greatest opportunity in the US is, is, is in this manufacturing and supply chain for uh, turbine components and using the entire supply chain. Um, so Matt just did a deep, deep dive into all these different supply chain needs. Um, again, it's really important to stress um, that you know, manufacturing and supply chain can be the largest contributor, but that does require the, the building of tier one manufacturing plants and that those facilities also source subcomponents, parts and materials from US-based suppliers during production. Um, what this chart isn't showing is the timing of the jobs and how those are linked with the pipeline of projects to be installed offshore. Uh, so when you consider the timing of job demand, you'll see that there's actually an immediate training need to support development, ports, installation, and eventually operations and maintenance jobs. Um, so even though those are the smaller contributors to jobs, their share increases as you consider how many jobs will be sourced domestically. Um, jobs will also increase as manufacturing 
and vessels are built and uh, support installation activities. Next slide, thank you. Um, so one of the most exciting things for me is how many different job roles are needed in the offshore wind industry. There are so many different types of jobs that require varying education levels and skills. Um, there are opportunities for skilled trades in the manufacturing installation space. There's an opportunity for higher level degrees in engineering to design and build these projects. And, and so there's just so many different parts of the industry for workers to get involved. Uh, so looking across these different sectors, um, in the manufacturing and supply chain, you know, there's so many different job roles associated with the assembly, the production of offshore wind components, and all those different sub-assemblies, all the, the steel that's required for a lot of these substructures. Um, but there's also job roles in management um, and engineering to support these facilities as well. In our analysis, we did see that the largest contribution of workers in the supply chain segment is for workers who are doing the physical processes in the factory involved in the production. There is a need to hire a significant number of skilled trade workers. Um, an example of this type of worker is welders. Um, currently, there's not enough workers with the experience to meet the demand of the offshore wind industry, especially when you're looking at uh, other renewable and other industries competing for, for skilled trade workers. In development, uh, in development, um, these mostly include the professional kind of roles that occur prior to installing the wind power plant. Uh, those roles include site assessment, plant design, financing, management, and different permitting review. Uh, the port segment under installation will serve as a hub for assembly operations and maintenance of the wind turbines. Uh, some different roles within ports include terminal crews, logistics and management, and facilities management. Uh, the largest contri contribution of workers for ports is again these terminal crews um, which are involved in the staging of components and the loading of vessels. Uh, these workers also typically have training in basic and skilled trades and so again you're kind of seeing this trend where there's a lot of different skilled trade needs across a lot of these different industry segments. Installing offshore wind components at sea requires a workforce that can operate vessels and install large industrial structures, machines, and cables, um, often in a challenging ocean environment. Um, each of these vessels has a, a worker on board comprising of marine project and construction crews. Um, in the United States, this workforce will need will largely depend on the number and types of vessels that we have available, the number of crew members on board those vessels, and how long uh, these different installation activities uh, take. Um, it's also important to note that a lot of these construction crews uh, will need specific safety training to operate at sea. And then finally, the O&M workforce. Um, these are more of those longer term jobs uh, that are operating and maintaining offshore wind energy projects. Um, they test, they repair, they maintain wind turbines and their components. Uh, typically, there's marine crews who transport the wind technicians to operate and maintain the offshore wind turbines. But then there's also onshore staff who provide management and engineering support. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in the assessment, we did identify 44 different offshore wind energy focused programs in the United States. Um, however, this list does continue to grow each month. Uh, NRL does maintain an offshore wind workforce education and training database. So I encourage you all to, to go on there as we're constantly adding new programs. Um, if you do have a program that you want to add, you can also are welcome to, to email me. Um, wanted to note that these programs are specific to offshore wind. So there are other programs that aren't considered in this number, um, such as uh, the large number of um, wind energy programs that are primarily focused on land-based wind. Um, as you can see on the chart on the left, um, every state in the North Mid-Atlantic coast has at least a program fo focused on offshore wind energy. Uh, the majority of education programs right now are located in Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey. Uh, these programs are across different job roles as shown in the bottom bar chart. So we do have programs supporting the trades, engineering, uh, and then there is a fair amount of just offshore general uh, coursework as well. In this assessment, uh, we did identify several strengths. Um, for offshore wind technician programs, uh, we identified that community colleges are already establishing offshore wind energy programs, uh, focus primarily on training technicians 
and uh, providing them safety training as well. Uh, existing wind technician training programs can provide between 100 and 125 graduates annually. So assuming that these programs are scaled up and new programs are added, um, this does appear to be a strength currently in the offshore wind space. Um, the United States also has a robust network of university programs um, who can educate students in professional engineering and management roles. Uh, since these skills are generally transferable across different industries, um, the development of new degree programs is not as critical as other segments. So some opportunities do exist um, to have an adequately trained workforce. Uh, the specialized skills training for factory workers and installation crews, I think, is a, a really important point to stress. Um, we do what we will need um, a large share of skilled trade workers. And so we will need additional community colleges and union led training programs, such as apprenticeships, to help meet the workforce need, especially for some of these roles, such as uh, factory level workers, port terminal crews, and these construction crews on vessels. Um, basic and skilled tradespeople are going to be in high demand for the offshore wind industry. They're also in high demand across other industries. They require years of experience uh, through these apprenticeship programs. So developing these training programs in partnership with planned facilities um, will ensure that we have a trained local workforce when and where needed. It's, um, we're also going to need to look at the standardization of safety certifications for people working at sea to operate and build these projects. Um, there's currently no officially adopted offshore wind energy safety standard in the United States, uh, but there are several organizations currently working on aligning existing standards and training requirements. Um, examples of some of these organizations include the Global Wind Organization, uh, who offers courses such as basic safety sea survival training. Um, and finally, there is an opportunity to transition workers from these maritime oil and gas industries and also just other existing generalized professionals um, so that they can use their prior knowledge and experience in other industries and transition it over to offshore wind. I think this will be critical to help meeting some of these initial early uh, jobs coming into the industry. Next slide. One of the biggest takeaways that we found when developing the assessment is that workforce roles are often characterized differently by companies, organizations, and different stakeholders. In the report, we did identify over 113 different types of job roles. Um, however, one thing we noticed is that organizations are really characterizing differently. And neither group is right or wrong. There's just a different way of characterizing different groups of skill sets. So it is extremely important that the industry starts to agree on the types and the functions of different roles, um, because with consensus on these roles, we can really start to standardize training requirements and the education needed. And then we'll have a better idea on how many programs are needed, who is teaching what skills, and really give the industry confidence um, so that we know that we have a, a big group of folks who are hired and properly trained to support all the different parts of the, the industry. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there is a, a great opportunity for a lot of different initiatives to develop the offshore wind workforce. And, and a lot of these initiatives are focused on creating benefits to local communities, ensuring that our workforce is diverse and inclusive, and supporting a transition from other adjacent industries. Uh, so here I've outlined kind of five key workforce initiatives. Uh, the first is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we are hearing from Almost every person we talk to that is such a high priority for all stakeholder groups to attract under, underrepresented and underserved populations. So as we're building this new industry, it's a great opportunity to make sure that we're getting um, many different folks in, involved in the, in the industry. And many states have started to incorporate provisions that offshore wind programs and projects must include a way to increase diversity in the, in the energy workforce. Uh, but one thing we do highlight is that we need more transparency in tracking and reporting these goals. Um, unions are another great uh, opportunity. They have an, a very important role to play in supporting manufacturing and installation activities. Uh, many of them are focusing on integrating their existing training and apprenticeship programs to grow their membership and support the offshore wind industry. Uh, speaking of in, uh, apprenticeships, uh, these have been identified as a core pathway for ex, uh, individuals to gain experience in the skills trades. Uh, 
So expanding existing union-led training programs can help meet the workforce need, um, especially for these factory level workers in manufacturing. Um, it is worth noting that there are far fewer registered apprenticeship programs in manufacturing than in construction. So th that will be a consideration for the manu manufacturing supply chain part of the industry. Um, apprenticeship programs do require multiple years of training. Um, so because we will need so many different trade workers, it does take time to trade these folks. So it's an important consideration uh, for workforce development. For adjacent industries, um, there is an opportunity for offshore wind to look to adjacent industries to supply workers. Um, they can transition over to offshore wind, use their existing knowledge and skills, while su supplementing with a little offshore wind specific training. A um, couple examples of this would be repurposing oil and gas facilities, um, especially in the Gulf, to allow those manufacturing workers to support the offshore wind across the country. Um, we could recruit and upskill members of adjacent marine industries as well. Um, an example being the fishing community to help fill in some of these installation uh, requirements. And, and finally, uh, economic development and workforce development are two levers that kind of go hand in hand. Um, so earnings from jobs are expected to drive economic growth in communities, um, especially near newly built manufacturing plants and ports. Uh, economic agencies are playing a critical role in supporting such activities in states. Uh, they're making investments in education programs and facilities uh, and port development, and they're also providing grants for workforce development and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next slide. And then finally, I think I really want to uh, express the importance of collaboration and partnerships. Um, Collaboration and partnerships across geographies will be critical in helping workforce development for the industry. Um, as part of our identification of education programs, we asked these different education programs if they're partnering with certain groups. Um, we found that 75% are partnering with industry, 70% are partnering with state or local governments, 66% uh, are partnering with edu other educational institutions, and 33% have collaborated with unions. Um, so these partnerships can really help um, overcome a lot of the challenges and really enhance the opportunities that we've talked about here today. They can help share best practices. Um, when developers, OEMs, and contractors share what types of workers and the skill sets they need, it can really help with these education institutions, standardize training requirements, and ensure that the workers are properly trained. Um, and most importantly, I think it really helps to leading to regional efficiencies. So I um, want to really express that regional partnerships can really help grow workforce uh, across the East Coast and across the country. Next slide. So all this and more uh, is detailed in the recently published US Offshore Wind Workforce Assessment. Um, within this report, you can find more detailed job estimates for all of these industry segments. Uh, we do identify the credentials for different offshore wind jobs. And we kind of do a, a gaps analysis of the education and training programs and discuss gaps and opportunities for these offshore wind uh, training programs. So uh, please definitely reach out if you have any questions as you're uh, reviewing this report. Always, always happy to answer in, uh, any questions. Uh, so with that, I'll say thank you and I'll turn it back over to Matilda. Awesome. Thank you, Jeremy and Matt, for those great presentations. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your great questions in the Q&A, some of which um, we have been addressing during the course of the, the webinar, but some of these uh, we'll be addressing live now in the last 10 minutes of the webinar. Um, so I first wanted to just start off um, by giving myself the opportunity to answer a couple of the questions that are related to equity, as I was one of the co-authors of the supply chain report, and my um, kind of section was focusing on equity. So the way that we approached it in the report was to establish a framework of metrics and indicators that can be used to evaluate equity um, for port communities during different stages of supply chain projects. So um, prior to them being built, during the course of um, building a new port or manufacturing facility, and then measuring outcomes afterwards. So I would recommend taking a look at that chapter for more information on how we considered it in the report. Um, as well as some examples of equity-related actions that have been taken. Um, 
And then to address one of the more specific questions about creating opportunity for economic inclusion, that is definitely something that we've been considering at NREL, um, how to ensure that local communities that are being impacted by this new supply chain are the ones that are prioritized in hiring and, and contracting. Um, and so again, I would just point to our previous reports. I won't take up all the time now to talk about it, but I'll say that both that and the environmental impact are things that we're considering in past reports and in uh, future supply chain reports that we are working on. And then for the first, um, the next question, I will direct this one to Jeremy. Uh, where did it go? Maybe someone already answered it. Um, I believe it was about how to get young people um, excited about joining the industry, especially when there may be uncertainty about where those jobs will be and what they will look like. Uh, Jeremy, if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I, I think the K through 12 space is definitely the area that um, groups need to be focusing more in on, um, especially if we're talking about, you know, meeting jobs 10, 20 years from now, uh, creating excitement with the next generation is super, super important. Um, there's a couple examples of programs in Ro Rhode Island. Um, there is the Wind, Wind Rhode Island program, which engages with K through 12 students um, and is developing offshore wind curriculum. Um, there's the Kid Wind program, which I know is having an offshore wind focused uh, competition this year for high school students. So, so I think I would answer that and say 100%, I think we need to be supporting K through 12 uh, teachers and students with the curriculum because it gets the students excited. It creates a awareness around these different types of jobs. They're able to go and uh, share their excitement with their parents, with their community. Uh, and I think it also helps more with this local workforce development piece. You know, if you're getting students excited in high schools and elementary schools, middle schools near offshore wind energy projects, um, they know about those projects. You know, when they get to uh, a, some type of post-secondary program or they go into a labor union or a skilled trade program, like they're going to think, oh, there are jobs in the offshore wind industry. Um, and so helping kind of to fill in those that, that workforce need that we, we see is coming. Awesome, thank you, Jeremy. And Matt, I think you might have already addressed this question in the chat, um, but I saw a question about, um, I, I keep losing my, losing my place in this chat, <laughs> um, oh, about the timeline, um, about whether this is a realistic timeline for developing a supply chain and new manufacturing, um, thinking that it may take longer than a decade and then what kind of um, private sector investment you think is needed? I'm wondering if you could expand on that in a verbal answer. Yeah, I think I think that's a good one to highlight. Um, so in, in in the report, we we look at um, the time frame, time frame needed to kind of permit and construct all the ports and manufacturing facilities. And, and we conclude that that would take maybe six to nine years uh, to, to, to really build the, the full supply chain. But that being said, I think the assumption that we put in place in that report was that at the start of that six to nine year window, all the decisions have basically been made. So people know who's building the facilities, where they're building them, how many of them we, we need to have. Um, and, and I think that's that's kind of the, the very uncertain uh, aspect of that at, at the moment. And I think that's what's going to that's going to take a long time. Um, because what that really involves is, is communication between a lot of different agencies. So those are the the manufacturers that are that are. Uh, that are building the facilities, the states that are either incentivizing them or encouraging them to come in, in some cases, maybe developing the, the ports uh, or port space for the facilities to go into as well. Um, and uh, the and the communities in which the, those those uh, those facilities are going to be built. Um, and I think that the, you know, the challenge is that the different states need to know what their neighbors and, and, and counterparts are doing. It doesn't make sense for every state along the East Coast to have a blade facility. Um, you know, one state should have a blade facility, one state should have a foundation facility, one state should have a cable facility, and, and so forth. And so I think we need to understand what are the relative strengths in terms of manufacturing and workforce and other resources that those states have, what makes the most sense to build in each state, um, and, then, and then how can those states kind of collaborate to make sure that, that we're uh, we're not overly redundant. Um, in in I think that in terms of like the level of investment we've already seen, I think that the, um, even in the absence of you know this supply chain report or the Inflation Reduction Act or a commercial scale project actually being built in the U.S., we've already seen 
several facilities that are operational. There's a cable facility in, in South Carolina. There's a monopile facility in New Jersey, which is uh, which is starting to roll out some of the first monopiles. Um, there's other construction work going on at, at ports and um, uh, other locations along the East Coast. And so um, we've, we've seen an, an announced level of investment, um, both from private and public uh, sources at the order of sort of $2 billion, if I remember my numbers right. Um, and, and we expect more to come now that the Inflation Reduction Act has included some in incentives and um, support for, for new offshore wind uh, manufacturing in the US. So um, I, I think it's been interesting to see that there's been this level of investment already. Um, and I think that will just continue to grow as, as sort of the um, the the reality of offshore wind becomes a little bit more concrete um, in in the U.S. in the near future. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Uh, for the next question to Jeremy, uh, someone asks, "What's the trajectory of job development? Will there be a point after initial production that we'd see a significant decrease in needed jobs?" Yeah, so there there definitely is an offshore wind trajectory um, within the offshore wind workforce roadmap. Uh, we do try to assess kind of the likelihood of how these jobs uh, develop over time. Um, you know, I think for development, we're very much in a development phase of a lot of these offshore wind projects now. So the majority of jobs in the offshore wind industry right now are supporting uh, the site assessment, kind of the, the project planning, project management of all of these projects. Um, but what you'll see is across uh, the manufacturing supply chain, ports, uh, vessels, and operations maintenance, there is kind of a, a curve that increases over time through 2030. Again, I think it's important to stress these the level of employment is really dependent on domestic content. So the more, uh, you know, it's for manufacturing supply chain, the uh, timing of jobs is really dependent on when manufacturing facilities open and how many different suppliers are using. Um, in terms of the initial production, seeing a significant, significant decrease in needed jobs, um, I think the hope is, and as Matt alluded to, is like sustainably developing this manufacturing and supply chain and the offshore wind industry. And so that we do have a pipeline of projects that are able to support these investments and support these workers. And so that, um, you know, even beyond 2030, um, we've we expect to see that these jobs will kind of stabilize and that um, there's kind of like a, a, maybe you don't see as exponential of a growth, but they kind of level off and continue to support the different construction um, supply chain and operations of the plants. I don't know if there's anything you would want to add about manufacturing and sustainability developing that, Matt. Um, sorry, I was answering a question in the chat. Could you repeat that, Jeremy? Not everything um, made the question to me. Oh, no, no. Yeah, we're uh, just discussing kind of will there be a point after initial production that we'll see a significant oh. get decrease in needed jobs. So I was just wondering if you had any comments about sustainably developing manufacturing supply chain. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Um, you know, I, I think that there's always going to be some ebbs and flows, but I think that what you know what we talk about and and I think what the what we've heard from a lot of industry is is just trying to establish sort of a stable baseline, um, and I think that that's reasonable to do uh, and and kind of set ourselves on a um, this like sustainable trajectory of installing something like four to six gigawatts a year, which is um, relatively small enough variation that. Um, that we can, I think, weather some of those like minor changes from year to year instead of you know doubling or halving production um, uh, on on an annual basis. Um, I think the the real question is like, um, to like what level of deployment we're actually going to get to. Um, that that four or five gigawatt four, or four or six gigawatts a year would you know get us to maybe like a hundred gigawatts of offshore wind by 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 twenty fifty. Um, but you know if there's a Kind of a goal to, to expand that deployment or, or actually have offshore wind be a bigger part of our energy portfolio, then, you know, we'd, we'd have to continue to think about how we grow the whole industry sustainably beyond that from the lease areas. So like, what's the demand for projects, the infrastructure? So what can the ports and vessels do, the workforce? Um, and then, of course, the, the manufacturing piece as well. So it's 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 definitely this interrelated question. And, and I think that 
Um, but just the, the last thing I would say, and, and sorry if I repeat re repeating this from you, Jeremy, but everyone we talk to in the industry is very aware of that problem. No one wants to be closing down factories. No one wants to be laying off workers. And so the plan is to really set that up to be a very sort of sustainable and um, and predictable um, uh, kind of workforce and, and industry. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. So it looks like we have run out of time, um, but if we didn't get to your question or you'd like it in written form, we will be sending out, as we usually do with these webinars, a list of the questions and answers. Um, so don't worry, it, it may take a few weeks, but we will get your questions answered. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thanks again to Department of Energy, Wind Exchange for supporting these webinars, and to Matt and Jeremy for their excellent presentations. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>